Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Delta Airlines June Quarter Financial Results Conference Call. My name is Cecilia, and I will be your coordinator. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode until we conduct a question-and-answer session following the presentation. As a reminder, today's call is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Jill Greer, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thanks, Cecilia. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for our June Quarter Earnings Call. Speaking today on the call will be our CEO, Ed Bastian, and our CFO, Paul Jacobson. We also have our president, Glenn Howenstein, and our entire leadership team here with us for the Q&A. To get in as many questions as possible during the Q&A, please limit yourself to one question and a brief follow-up. Today's discussion contains forward-looking statements that represent our beliefs or expectations about future events. All forward-looking statements involve risks and uncertainties that could cause the actual results to differ materially from the forward-looking statements. Some of the factors that may cause such differences are described in Delta's SEC filings. We'll also discuss non-GAAP financial measures. All results exclude special items unless otherwise noted. You can find a reconciliation of our non-GAAP measures on the Investor Relations page at ir.delta.com. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ed. Thanks, Jill. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are now four months into the pandemic, and the nearly $4 billion pre-tax loss that we just posted reflects the severe impact that COVID-19 is having on our company and our industry. The June quarter was remarkable for a confluence of crises that have rocked our nation. In addition to the pandemic and its impact on public health and the economy, the issue of inequality and social injustice for black Americans has been front and center. In this environment, our number one focus is taking care of our people. This includes not only protecting the health and safety of our employees, but also maintaining our commitment to supporting the fight for equality and social justice. We are committed to listening and understanding. We must be a stronger advocate for justice and equality across our business, from our operating procedures to the programs that we offer our people to support for policy change. Our people are the heart and soul of Delta and I am incredibly proud of their uh, perseverance and resiliency through these trying times and forever grateful for the sacrifices that they are making for our company. Since demand bottomed in mid-April at less than 5% of our normal traffic, we've seen a small but welcome uptick in passenger volume, being driven almost entirely by domestic leisure travelers or those flying for essential reasons. And while it's encouraging to see customers start to return, the revenue environment remains challenging. We have thought from the start that the recovery will be choppy, and the past few weeks have shown that to be true. We're expecting our overall revenue for the September quarter will be only 20 to 25 percent of what we saw last summer, and we've seen demand growth flatten recently with the rise in COVID-19 cases. We are watching trends closely and have pared back our capacity plans for August. Business travel, which typically provides 50% of our revenue, is not yet returned in any meaningful way. With corporate offices slow to reopen, quarantine restrictions in markets like New York and Chicago, and states in the Sun Belt reversing or pausing reopening plans, we remain cautious on the pace of recovery through the balance of the year. In addition, there isn't a clear timeline when international borders will open for U.S. travelers. So it's against that uncertain backdrop that we are taking the industry's most conservative approach to capacity. For the September quarter, we expect our seats available for sale, which accounts for our 60% load factor cap, will be 20 to 25% of last year's level, up from 10% in the June quarter. Given how dynamic the current environment is, we are maintaining our flexibility and will adjust our capacity plans as needed based on changes in demand. Since the crisis began, we have taken decisive actions to protect our people and our customers, increase our liquidity, and importantly, preserve our ability to respond in the future. Customer employee safety remain our top priority and restoring consumer confidence in travel is at the forefront of our recovery plan. We have taken extensive and proactive measures to implement a multi-layer approach to protect customers. Additionally, all of our aircraft are equipped with HEPA filters, generating high-quality, hospital-grade air quality on board. 
restoring consumer confidence to travel on Delta is the driving force behind our Delta Care standard, which includes requiring customers and employees to wear masks, enhancing cleaning protocols for aircraft, electrostatic spraying before every departure, blocking middle seats, and capping load factors at 60% to provide more space on board. We're committed to blocking middle seats through September and expect to continue our policy beyond that date as well. We've also created a Delta Global Cleanliness Organization and are collaborating with two of the world's best health organizations, the Mayo Clinic and Quest Diagnostics. The Mayo Clinic is helping to assess our safety protocols, consulting on how to improve safeguards, as well as designing COVID-19 testing for our full workforce, both for the active virus and the presence of antibodies. The added layers of protection are having in these changes as of the 1st of May. The infection rate among our customers who spend their days working on board our aircraft and in our airports is well below the national average, providing another solid travel. In addition, our net promoter scores have never been higher as customers recognize our health and safety efforts on board and on the ground. Priority has been to protect our liquidity. Paul and the team moved quickly and decisively to raise capital, ending the quarter with liquidity. Entering this crisis with a strong balance sheet allowed $18 billion in new capital on top of the $5.4 billion from the CARES Act without issuing equity. This critical, the most important liquidity action we can take is reducing our cash burn. In June, the month averaged $27 million a day, a substantial improvement from the $100 million thing in late March. The major force in that improvement is our cost as we'll take out over 50% of our total operating expenses for both the June and September quarters. That's due in large part to the more than 40,000 Delta people who have volunteered to take short-term unpaid leaves. Our crews who have seen their hours reduced as flying has been cut back, and the sacrifices made by our hour work schedules have been similar, similarly reduced by 20, 25%. I want to thank for an unpaid leave. They're making a real difference in helping us navigate this crisis. We also want to thank all our colleagues who have been serving our customers in the face of this pandemic. This is inspirational, and that Delta difference has never shined brighter. Stalled at present, we expect July's daily cash burn to be similar as we go through the summer and into the fall. Once what we're seeing in the revenue environment with our ability to get costs out of the business and keep us on the path to achieve our goal of break-even cash burn by the end of the combined effects of the pandemic and associated financial impact on the global economy. We continue to believe before we see a sustainable recovery. So to succeed in this environment, we are building resilience across the company, increasing albeit one that will need to be smaller. It means accelerating strategies to streamline our company, simplify our fleet, and reduce our fixed costs in the past. We have made the, the decision to permanently retire more than 100 aircraft this year, MD-88, MD-90, 777, and 737. We have the most flexible Pulling for these and additional fleet, which we believe will provide a lasting benefit to our cost structure. The difficult reality of reaching a smaller workforce until we see demand return. We'll be wrapping up our voluntary departure and early retirement program tonight. We already had over 17,000 employees depart the company. We also have thousands more signed up for absence into the fall. We are hopeful 
that we can accomplish the vast majority of the headcount changes we need through these programs, minimizing, if not eliminating, the need for involuntary furloughs. This will require across all of our work groups. And I'm hopeful that we can get there. And as we navigate this difficult, our airline partners around the world who are facing even more significant financial challenges. During the quarter, both LOTAM and Aeromexico Chapter 11, and Virgin Recapitalization. While each of these is disappointing, none of our partners' home country financial support similar to what the U.S. Treasury did with the CARES Act, which necessitated their decisions to restructure. We have the most, the utmost confidence in all of our partners, partnerships, which will be important more resilient international network in the, in the uh, recovery. In closing, we remain grounded in the strengths that are core to Delta's business. Our people, our brand, our network. And these strengths and the shared values of the Delta family guide every decision we make, differentiate positioning us to succeed when demand returns. I want to thank everyone who's contributing to Delta through the most challenging time in this storied company's history. Our customers, partners, suppliers, owners, community, their support has been overwhelming. And a special thank you to the finest group of airline professionals ever assembled, our Delta people who are managing this difficult environment, determined to return Delta to her position of leadership in our industry and in our world. And with that, I'll turn it over to Paul to go through our financials. Paul? Thank you, Ed, and good morning, everybody. These June quarter results we reported this morning illustrate the truly staggeredness. Revenues declined 91%, and we reported a $3.9 billion pre-tax loss, one of the largest in Delta's history. Results exclude several items directly related to the impact from COVID-19 and our response, including charges from fleet-related decisions, $2.1 billion in write-downs related to equity partners, and a $1.3 billion benefit from the CARES Act grant recognized during the quarter. During this quarter, our total operating expenses declined $5.5 billion, or 53%. The June quarter cost performance was more than $400 million better than our original expectations. Credible contributions of more than 40,000 employees who have elected to take voluntary unpaid, unpaid leave. Essentially reduced flying, fuel expense was nearly $2 billion lower compared to the prior year quarter, and we generated over $250 million of savings from parking more than 700 aircraft. We were also able to reduce facilities expense by consolidating concourses and temporarily closing sky clubs while eliminating nearly all discretionary spending. In the September quarter, we expect to achieve a similar 50% year-over-year reduction in a sequential increase in capacity. This reflects the increased variability we've achieved in our cost structure and what we've been discussing since the COVID epidemic. As Ed said, our top financial priority remains to ensure that we have sufficient liquidity to weather whatever comes at us. To this end, we've taken decisive action to bolster our liquidity position, ending the quarter with $15.7 billion of liquidity. Daily cash burn also improved sequentially each month during the quarter to average $27 million in the month of June. This outperformed our initial expectation of $50 million cash burn per day during the two months of June, during the month of June, sorry. One third of that improvement came from better cost performance with two thirds from an improvement in net sales, which inflected positive in early June and remained there. It's worth noting that approximately $10 million of our cash burn is attributable to our international business. So our domestic business is only burning $17 million a day, which is a testament to the efficiency of the reduced operation. We are staying agile to balance what we're seeing in the revenue environment with our, this approach improves our cash burn trajectory, which helps us to preserve our balance sheet capacity for the 
Strength of our balance sheet has been evident during the pandemic as we have raised $15 billion in new liquidity at a blended average rate of 5.5%. When combined with funds received under the CARES Act payroll support program, we ended the June quarter with this $15.7 billion of liquidity. Even with no improvement in our cash burn rate, this equates to 19 months of liquidity. This is more than sufficient to address our upcoming maturities. We need to continue to raise additional capital, leveraging our unencumbered assets tax secured loan program. In an effort to ensure compliance, we also amended all of our bank credit facilities to permanently open it with a $2 billion minimum liquidity covenant. So in spite of the significant amount of debt we have raised, our adjusted net debt has only increased by $3.4 billion since the start of the year to $13.9 billion. Reducing our daily cap debt down, and that is why we remain uniquely focused on it. While we have a long road ahead of us, we've made tremendous progress in just the last four months. By raising cash early and aggressively managing costs, we are prepared to navigate what will be a volatile revenue period while making decisions that position Delta well for the eventual recovery. Our people have acted quickly and decisively to protect our customers and our company, and I'm so proud of what the people of Delta have accomplished with that grace, professionalism, and determination that Ed mentioned. They are the reason I'm confident we will emerge from this crisis as a stronger more resilient Delta as our customers return. And with that, to begin the Q&A. Thanks, Paul. Cecilia, we are ready for questions from the analysts. If you could give them instructions on how to get in the queue. Thank you. If you'd like to signal for a question at this time, please press and please make sure that your mute function is turned off so your signal can reach our equipment. Again, star one. And we'll go first to Hunter K of Wolf Research. Uh, hey, good morning, everybody. Um, good morning, Ed, you, Ed, you mentioned you recently said you expect some amount of business travel. I think you said 20% will turn out to be unproductive uh, in return. So what are some of the travelers that do come back that might be different from the ones who don't? Like, for example, maybe they fly more per year, but to fewer cities, or these are the people that use lounges more often. Look like, and how do you win them or keep them? Well, first of all, Hunter, I, I think fundamentally business travel is going to come back, and it's going to come back at scale. I, I'm not one that, that thinks that we are in a permanently you know, depressed uh, level of business travel for the foreseeable. There's a lot of inefficiency, which we can all appreciate in business travel. Uh, the number of trips that the is going to come down in certain cases, uh, the international trips, that we've all been on where we've flown over to Europe for a, for a two-hour meeting and flown back that does nothing but beat you up can you certainly be much easily better accommodated uh, over a video call. But it's going to be trips that are focused on relationship building, uh, interacting, uh, whether it's with, with your, your customers, convention, uh, reviewing performance, on a global scale, those those are going to stay. I, I just don't substitute for that over time. It will take some time to get back back entirely to where we were in 2019 on the volume of business traffic, but the resiliency of the business traffic that we are going to now bake, I think, will be a better uh, way of the recovery. And then another one for you, Ed. When was the last time you talked to Steve Squarey, and what is your single biggest shared commercial concern for you is most important to preserve the relationship and the economics that your company share? Uh, I talk to Steve all the time. Uh, he's not just a great business partner. He's a great friend. And uh, we share our thoughts and strategies together. Uh, we are their biggest uh, and most important business partner, and American Express is ours in turn. And this crisis together in a way that uh, you would expect. 
recovery over the course of the quarter in volumes on the card, which which is uh, certainly one of the, the revenue recovery we're seeing on spend. But they, they provide a great lens into customer things that, that are going to be very important for Delta. Delta. To, uh, to maintain companies. So I'm, uh, I, I continue, as Steve does, to be optimistic of the future. We're both realistic. We realize uh, the T&E spend is not going to be at the levels uh, we saw in, in the prior, do our very best to build a better, a better future for our respective stakeholders. Thank you. And our next question comes from Jamie Baker of J JP Morgan. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, Paul, a question on labor. So as I see it, there are sort of four moving parts here. We've got the voluntary unpaid leaves, which have already dropped off the P&L for now, but some level phase back in in the future. We've got the early retirement, which will completely drop out. We've got what might happen first, and, and then I assume in the event of furloughs, you, you have some what I'm trying to reconcile with these various flows is whether the net is that they temporarily give you labor cost relief in the fourth quarter, and, and that's what gets you to cash break even, but then labor costs potentially rise after that. I guess, I, I guess another way of asking is, in what quarter do you think your labor expense line will truly be reflective of the cost structure going forward? Hey, good good morning, Jamie. Um, there's a there's a lot in that question. Um, you know, I think we're 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 still really assessing the overlap right now between the voluntary leave program. So there's a sense of um, uh, duplication there. But what it does do, you know, at a at an absolute minimum, is it puts a permanence around what were short term leaves and volatility. Um, so we, we expect that in addition to the to the leaves that Ed mentioned, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the separations that Ed mentioned uh, voluntarily, uh, we also have leaves that will continue on top of that. Um, so we're going to continue to assess and, and, and see where we stand on the salaries and related line. Uh, there's no doubt that that's been a big driver of how we've gotten our cash burn down in, in quick action. And uh, as we continue to shape the airline for how we think it's going to be sized next summer and into the future, we've got to be able to manage all of that agility and flexibility. And the, the voluntary leaves are going to be continue to be an important piece of that puzzle going forward. So as we think about uh, uh, salaries and related, you know, we, we should get to that kind of trend line, I would think, in that fourth quarter, first quarter, but then we'll okay. see as demand shapes back, customers are ultimately going to determine how big the airline is. Hey, Jamie, Got if it. I could add a couple of thoughts. You know, for the, the second quarter and the third quarter, we are reducing our total operating expenses by a, a bit over 50%, which, which is enormous. And uh, that will continue to be our goal as we as we progress through the fourth quarter as well. And while the composition of, of the savings uh, will be more sustainable given the size of the uh, early outs that we have 20% of the company will be will be exiting and as you can appreciate it's the senior most 20% of the company as well which is going to give us an added benefit on top uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of creativity and collaboration with our work groups about reducing work trying to protect jobs and everyone uh, pitching in to uh, to work fewer hours but to shave more save more jobs and that's that's across the company there's a real uh, spirit of doing that. So, you know, whether it gets to the fourth quarter, first quarter, at some point, you know, the, the labor savings here are, are sustainable. But to answer your question more specifically, it's really going to be on the commercial side of the business. It's going to be much more important to getting us down to that break-even level. You know, as demand hopefully starts to, uh, to growth uh, picks up once again as we look into the late summer and fall. And that will be uh, the more important contributor to getting to a break-even cash flow position. Okay, that's very helpful. Uh, second multi-part question, uh, how do we think of loyalty in the remaining unencumbered asset pool? Does Delta have the flexibility to do what United did with loyalty, you know, in terms of, you know, sort of a quasi-securitization of both third-party sales and the intercompany uh, cash flows? Uh, or did you pledge SkyMiles as 
you know, as, as part of the loan. So, um, you know, Jamie, I were a uh, infinitely competitive business, but, you know, hats off to United for that execution. I thought they did a, a very good job with that. Uh, and, you know, it, it's one that I think is available to a multitude of carriers. Um, that mm. is not included in the most recent guidance that we've given of six to seven billion dollars of unencumbered assets. Um, and, uh, you know, we're looking at all of our options and we'll continue to keep them open. Uh, we have made, uh, we have advanced the ball with the government uh, by uh, signing the term sheet, which they announced a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, you know, we continue to move along that process, but we have not decided to take uh, a government loan and, and mm -hmm. we're assessing really all of our options as well as the environment that we're in. Thanks for indulging my questions. Take care. We'll go next to Dwayne Fendingworth of Evercore ISI. Hey, thanks. Um, to totally agree with the perspective that uh, Delta has been careful uh, with capacity and, and how you brought it back. Um, just from an industry perspective, it looked like the industry has guessed wrong on July, uh, at least so far. Um, so, so schedules indicate your capacity is up about 90%, 90 percent, nine zero, from June to July. Uh, yet demand has stalled. So I'm just curious how cash burn uh, can be similar in July versus June. Uh, was it just that we had a, a good July 4th on the books before demand rolled over, or is there something going on with you know debt payments and capex? Well, I'll um, I'll, I'll I'll start with that, Dwayne. First of all, good morning. Um, you know the the trajectory that we've been on and and what we articulated um, through through June was that we had seen steadily increasing uh, net sales that was coming really from from both variables sales were going up and trending higher while at the same time refunds have been trending down which put us from you know a, a uh, I think at the beginning we said 20 to 30 million dollars a day we were burning in March uh, to turning positive and staying there in June. So while we've seen that that sales growth level off uh, in the wake of you know the latest rise in infections, it has remained relatively stable uh, in that area. So as we see the continued trajectory of reducing our operating expenses 50% and keeping those net sales numbers uh, relatively flat, that's where uh, July comes out flat to June. Okay, thanks, Paul, and, and maybe maybe I'll stick with you. Um, just high level, how has your budget for aircraft rent uh, changed for this year as we think about the net impact of uh, sale leaseback activity versus um, aircraft retirements? The, the only reason I bring it up is it looked like the, the op lease liabilities didn't really change much sequentially. So maybe you can help us um, understand what's going on uh, under the covers. Thank you. Yeah, I think, Dwayne, uh, we'll, we'll take that offline, and, and it'll be more apparent in, when the queue comes out later today um, of, you know, just the breakdown between financing leases and operating leases under under all the new accounting guidelines. So uh, it's it's all there, but uh, has a little bit of a different geography to it, depending on the transactions. Okay, I'll keep it there. Thank you. We'll go next to Helene Becker of Cowan. Um, thank you very much, operator. I appreciate the time. Hi. Um, so I have two questions. One is your comments on international um, and the triple sevens that are leaving the fleet and some of the seven six seven. You know, it would seem like you might have to do more pruning there. So, so have you like retired enough aircraft? Do you think, or do we expect to see more during the rest of the year? Hi, Elaine. It's it's Ed. I you know international is going to lag domestic. I think we have some time to watch how how it recovers. The triple seven fleet for us was the sub fleet that uh, made the most sense to to sit down. Uh, we certainly have additional international capable aircraft. Uh, we have a very large seven six seven fleet with with opportunities to to early retire as we get a better sense for where the uh, recovery is, but you know some of those decisions we have a little bit of time to take yet. As, as I indicated in my remarks, there's, there's more to be done, uh, and uh, we're not investing any money in that fleet, and we can, we can see how international uh, recovery is shaped before we make those final decisions. 
Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. And then my follow-up question really has to do with changes in booking patterns because of increased refunds um, or, or because of more flexibility to, um, you know, people who, who book and then maybe cancel. So could you just um, address, you know, people booking and then actually showing up for the flight, especially in July, or are you seeing people booking and then canceling at the last instant? Elaine, hi, it's Glenn. How are you doing? Uh, we've seen the no-show rates. Uh, good. I uh, hope your summer is going well. Uh, we've seen no-show rates grow from about 3% historically to about high single digits. So <coughs> most people at day of departure who have reservations are showing up for the flight, but uh, the higher no-show rates also makes it a little bit harder to revenue manage with the caps. So we've been managing through that, and we hope we can get better and better at that as we move through the fall, but clearly giving people more flexibility is where we need to be as uh, there's so much uncertainty in, in the virus right now. Um, gotcha, thanks very much. Uh, since I'm still in Paradise Prison, my summer is not going as well as I would like, but thank you for asking. <laughs> we're, re we're ready to release you, Helene. <laughs> <laughs> not soon enough, <laughs> but thank you. We'll go next to Joe Cayado of Credit Suisse. Hey, thanks. Good morning. Um, my first question relates to, to your fleet and, and um, actually your order book. Any update on your discussions with, with Airbus um, regarding your, your order book there? Could, and can you describe for us maybe what it is that, that you're hoping to achieve there? Do you just want to sort of adjust the timeline for deliveries? Or are you looking to restructure sort of the composition of the aircraft in the order book? Um, just any details there. Thanks. Uh, we are working with Airbus, as you can appreciate, and they've been very good partners with us, you know, managing the crisis. Clearly, we're in a situation where we don't need any aircraft. We have a lot of aircraft on the ground and uh, doing our best to manage through the next uh, you know, 18 to 24 months to minimize uh, deliveries. We're not ready to make any announcements yet. Uh, I can assure you there will be no cash capex on any aircraft uh, at Delta, you know, for, for some period of time, certainly through the end of this year. And um, it, Airbus has done, been a very good partner. I got it. That's, that's very clear on, on, um, on the CapEx, but uh, I, I was curious just especially as it relates to your comments on, on the expected uh, timelines for recovery of, of domestic versus international, um, if you'd also be looking to to adjust the, the actual composition of the aircraft that are in your order book as opposed to just uh, um, actually delaying um, or revising the timeline for the deliveries. Um, and and uh, it's an actual follow-up, which is just a, a quick clarification um, for Paul on the stalled demand recovery. Um, did, did you say that July net bookings are, are flat with June? Um, so, so they are positive month to date. Can you just describe in a little bit more detail the evolution in, in those net bookings trends over the last two weeks? You want to start? Hey, thanks hey, for, uh, for all the for all the help. Yeah, no, that's okay, Joe. On your on your question with Airbus again, we're not we're not you know, providing any specifics at this point. Is pushing a lot of the, the deliveries to the right, and uh, and when we're ready to uh, to we haven't reached a final. Um, Plan with Airbus when we when we do reach that plan, we'll be sure to let you know. And Joe, on the uh, on the cash burn, so we we had seen um, a pretty steady progression upwards of of sales and uh, a slight decline in in refunds, really kind of from May to uh, early mid June, uh, and that's when we started to see it stabilize. So the the data that was consistent with what we saw at the end of June. Uh, which is really a rough wave of, of infections throughout the the confidence that it's that it's somewhat stabilized here at these levels and hopefully uh, if things those levels uh, as we get later into the quarter thank you very much go next to Mike Lindenberg of Deutsche Bank Um, hey, Paul, just back to, you know, how you're thinking about the ATL as we progress through the quarter. 
normal year, you know, the seasonal impact is that, you know, as we get to the latter part of the quarter, we tend to see, um, you know, become a drag on cash. And I realize that this is not a normal year. So, I mean, are you sort of expecting that as we get into the latter part of it on the ATL or, you know, sort of where, 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 where's your thinking around that right now? Hey, good morning, Mike. Uh, that's that's a bit of a doozy of a question because I think the one thing we all know is that the, the historical air traffic liability models are broken uh, right now. <laughs> it's, it's not behaving in any way that a normalized seasonality pattern would have. You know, as evidence, we've actually refunded uh, now over $2 billion of that ATL since wow. the beginning of the year, which the bulk of that uh, has been done in the, in the post-COVID, uh, post-March 1. Uh, time frame. So we actually think that a lot of that refund activity, particularly in the transatlantic and international destinations, which we did heading into the summer, and it's a little bit of a, uh, it's a big contributor to the that I gave that composition in my prepared see things stabilizing, and we would expect that refunds will continue to trend uh, obviously, it's going to be choppy, but uh, any new sales data that come in, any new demand, go in a way that seasonally. So, we're we're prepared. Given is that there's a lot of uncertainty here, which is why we've gone looking to to raise as much liquidity. Helpful, and then just maybe this is an easier one. You you talked earlier about upcoming maturities, and I'll, I'll throw CapEx in there as well. As we look to the second part of the year, sure it's probably close to zero now based on, you know, everything that you've, you've cut back or deferred. Um, and you did a – what, what are the big maturities for the second half of 2020? Thanks for taking my – so the uh, we didn't give any uh, formal capex guidance because it's it's really the same as we gave uh, immediately after the the COVID ec epidemic, which is we've essentially eliminated all capex. There's some technology spend on projects um, that uh, um, are already in in process and some small purchases here and there, but it's not material to the overall story. As far as debt maturities go, um, you know, the biggest one we have is a $450 million maturity in December. Uh, when you combine that with in April of 21, that's the unsecured deal that we just took out. Um, so uh, we, we've already successfully refinanced that. And then we have the $3 billion bridge loan uh, that is due in March uh, that has uh, collateral attached to it that uh, – you know, we haven't decided exactly what to do with uh, that. As part of the uh, uh, amendment to the uh, credit facilities, we also extended uh, by one year the $1.3 billion maturity in April of, of our revolver. So that's pushed out to 2022. Uh, so uh, we've actually gotten a very, very good handle on uh, all of the maturities really for the next uh, 18 months. Great. Thanks for that. And we'll, we'll go next to Savvy Scythe of Raymond James. Hey, good morning. Um, just a couple of follow-up questions on, on the cash burn. Um, you know, if we don't get much of an improvement on the commercial side, what, what do you think you can kind of get the cash burn by the fourth quarter with some of the incremental things that are happening on the cost side? Hey, good morning, Savi. You know, I think, uh, as we mentioned in our comments, we're, we're kind of on this trajectory right now as things have have stabilized and you know we're continuing to assess what the second half looks like. continue to monitor capacity and and demand uh, that all of its side as well but you know I think we're uh, continued improvement in demand however uh, gradual and however choppy that might be um, you know, we're we're 90 days into this, and we already know a lot more about this. A little bit more confidence in the longer and intermediate term uh, demand profile, but uh, we've got to continue to be agile. So I think we'll kind of be in this mid 20s s, and uh, you know, if we need to take further actions, we will. Hey, Savi, this is Ed. I don't want anyone to get a sense that we've got a 
gloomy forecast on, on revenue. Uh, this is uh, expected. Uh, we, we said at the start of this, this, this pandemic that this is all, uh, it's going to be driven by factors outside of our control. It's really advances on the medical front uh, in containing the virus. It's, it's advances by, by general, the general public about wearing masks and doing their very best to be cautious and, and restoring uh, confidence in air travel. Uh, I, I'm optimistic as we get through you know, the late summer and the fall, we're going to see some real improvements here. Uh, we need to see improvements, and I think the sensitivity and the caution you hear in our voice for the current month is, is the fact that we're in the South and we're, we're, we're obviously um, more of a closed setting in, in our local economy than opening, but at the same time, that's for the goal of reopening later this, this uh, summer and fall to a bit. I do think you're going to see continued improvement in cash burn. Um, you got more than 50% of your costs out. It's hard to see much more coming out. I think it's going to be the, the, the same the same type of momentum that we saw in June, hopefully you know, re-emerging in, in the latter part of the summer and early fall that's going to make another material dent in bringing us down to that flat uh, break-even level. That, that makes sense and helpful. And, and my other follow-up question is just on the business travel commentary, you know, it looks like a lot of probably business travel might not happen until 2021, but just based on your surveys and things like that, is there any level of expectation of what, what we might see in, in the fourth quarter here? Or and, and, and kind of tied to that, I mean, does kind of the block middle seat uh, get removed, you know, when demand is stronger or when the virus is, is, is a little bit more contained? Or, you know, what drives those decisions? We're talking to our corporates all the time. As you can appreciate, and doing a lot of work with them to get them more confident. They are starting to come back. Uh, we, they're in small numbers, but they're starting. And, and what we've been doing is is taking them out with us on uh, on tours and, and seeing the airport. It's it's interesting. Their life uh, uh, in this environment it feels very different, and they need to refamiliarize themselves with what it what it's like and and the benefits of air travel. And I'd say the most um, significant observation that they give us is that it is actually not only safe, it's significantly better than travel was pre-pandemic. So there's confidence that's returning. I think you're going to see it improve as businesses start to reopen. I'd say it's a post-Labor Day. Uh, businesses start to open up. Uh, as international operations start to slowly open up, you'll see that'll be enough travel. But business travel is going to clearly be a, a 12 to 18-month to uh, lag. Advances on the medical front, vaccines, uh, if they're a, you know, it, it's safe that companies can safely put their, their – their. the other thing, and I mentioned this in one of the interviews, I did this morning is that while the corporations may not be traveling, we know the individuals are traveling, and we see it in the Sky Miles data and our, our information. So people are learning about the new way of travel, and they're telling us it's actually better than it was. You know. And is it the middle, the block middle seats? Is, is that demand levels? High? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that, Sabi. Sorry, on the kind of, it, it, you mentioned that the middle seat being blocked probably continues. What drives that decision? Well, that's, that's going to be consumer confidence. Uh, we're going to hear from customers as to their their comfort flights uh, that we have to add back yet and opportunities to add flights back with the middle seats. And um, of the, uh, the end of the year and into early next year but right now I don't see I don't see a, a push to do that you know customers aren't pushing us to do it and in more seats into the market in a safe way than trying to to uh, maximize the number of people you can put on an individual air, air, airplane and I think that's you know that would be inconsistent with the brand that Delta represents thank you we'll go next to Brandon Oglinski at Barclays Thanks for taking my question. 
question. Um, if business demand is going to lag here, you know, and you have some competitors out there that are going to come out of this without a lot of incremental debt, you know, what can in the network be more leisure focused, maybe lower cost? And, you know, does that impact, you know, the prior strategy of really focusing on the branded products and everything on board? Uh, Brandon, as I said, I'm not sure who you're referring to. Uh, million dollars at this point, so tremendous amount of, of increased. Then on the company, obviously, there's a large, large amount of money that we uh, we raised, but we uh, we also have a significant amount of cash that we can use to to hopefully retire that once we get through the other side. Uh, you know, we're we're not changing our our, our long term goal. For, for this company, this brand. We are a, a business-oriented airline. Uh, we are a premium-oriented uh, airline, and there's nothing that I see from what we suggest customers aren't going to value premium value. Equipment. And But we're going to be more resilient because there's a, there's a portion of that travel that will go away and we'll size our business accordingly. So I don't, I don't see anything that, that gives me pause. Of course, there's going to be a lot of dislocation and disruption. It always happens in this industry uh, during times of crisis. But I think we're pretty well positioned to be uh, to come out this in a relatively stronger uh, competitive position than we. Uh... Well, I appreciate you know looking forward as, as anyone's guest here, but can you give us any clarity on what? And I think maybe Paul alluded to it, but what level of demand you're expecting to get to cash break even by the end of the year? And then maybe even more importantly, uh, you know, where you're seeing the sizing of the network for 2021 uh, as you're making, you know, these difficult decisions. High level, Brandon, if you look at our cash burn in June as well as in July in that $27 million a day, day number, uh, virtually all of that needs to come through uh, improvement in net cash sales. Uh, it's going to come in two ways. So one, the, the refund activity will continue to wind down. Uh, that will be a contributor in that. Uh, you know, that's probably in the you know, plus or minus $5 million a day uh, improvement by the time we get to the end of the year, which leaves about $20 million of, of cash sales uh, improvement. And that's, you think of a company our size, that's about a 20% improvement in our overall business volume that will About twenty million dollars of, of cash sales uh, improvement, and that's you think of a company our size that's about a twenty percent improvement in our overall business volume. That will have time for one more question from the analysts. Thank you. That question will come from Joseph Denardi of Stiefel. <clears throat> Oh, thanks. Good morning. Um, Ed, I, I think over the last few years, you and, and your larger peers have been of the view that the, the DOJ had kind of put a red light on additional consolidation. I'm wondering if you think that has changed or that it needs the change and, and whether the calculus around how much uh, liquidity you think you need takes into account that uh, maybe consolidation, uh, you know, is eventually uh, part of the strategy. Uh, Joe, you know we can't speculate on that. Okay. Um, not, not, not to be terse, but you know that would be a really, <laughs> really uh, you know, inappropriate uh, response I'd have to give on that. Okay, fair enough. Um, Paul, can you give us wh where you guys are year to date on on mileage, sales, cash proceeds? I think you did about 4.2 billion last year. Where, where are you guys year to date? Yeah, we, we've seen Joe about uh, about a 50% reduction uh, in the uh, in in the last quarter. Uh, you know, I think if you look at uh, some of American Express's commentary, it's 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 in line to even slightly better than some of the cards in their portfolio, which I think is encouraging. That means that that people remain attached to the brand uh, and they see value in in the miles program. So we're going to continue to see that, but it obviously has been. Uh, far more resilient than the demand for uh, uh, tickets and for travel itself, which is what we expected. Thank you. Thank you. 
And that's going to wrap the analyst portion of the call. I will turn it over to Tim Mapes, our Chief Marketing and Communications Officer, for the media portion. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we have about 10 minutes of questions for members of the media. I just remind everyone, please, just a question and maybe a brief follow-up. We'll try to get through as many as we can. And again, that is star one to signal if you have a question at this time. And we'll go first to Robert Silk of Travel Weekly. Yes, uh, good morning. Um, in the uh, Virgin Atlantic announcement today, they mentioned for their restructuring plan that they are doing this with the support of shareholders, the Virgin Group, and Delta, as well as some new investors. So I was wondering if there's any color or detail on, on the, in the manner in which Delta is supporting this effort. Uh, not uh, other than what's already been disclosed, which is that we are uh, contributing through uh, deferral of, of brand fees as well as certain other uh, joint venture fees that we would typically earn. Um, we were um, excited to see the, the recapitalization come about. It's been an extraordinarily difficult uh, few months pulling that together, and, and all stakeholders have made some meaningful contributions to enable uh, Virgin to, to fly uh, again, and uh, we're excited about that. Okay, thanks, Ed. We'll go next to Mary Schlangenstein at Bloomberg News. Hi, thank you, good morning. Um, I wanted to see if you could break down for us how much of your second quarter revenue and, and possibly revenue going forward is from newly purchased tickets versus how much is from rescheduled flying? Sure, we have about two-thirds of the revenue coming in from newly purchased tickets and about a third coming in from uh, reissues and credits from the uh, postponed journey. So we're getting a, a significant number of new journeys coming in, which is a, a good sign. And, and did the, I assume that the, the new ticket purchasing fell um, in this recent sort of slump as well as uh, the rescheduled. Is that right? You know, if I, if I could uh, recharacterize it from a slump to really a, a much slower growth rate is that uh, mm -hmm. the, industry had, the industry had an awful lot of capacity going from June into July. And uh, so uh, what we've seen is a we, in June we were growing at about 20% every week, week over week. I think maybe in some ways uh, that capacity is going to take a little bit longer to get absorbed because the growth rates of, if you take 4th of July out, they're uh, coming in in between 5 and 10% now. So the growth growth is at a much slower rate. Uh, as we look forward, you know, it, it has it has slowed, but it hasn't stalled. I mean, it's, it's very flattish, just up slightly, but it's not a slump. Okay, thank you. We'll go next to Don Gilbertson of USA Today. Hi, good morning. Ed, I think you mentioned uh, employee coronavirus infections being down because of all the measures you've put in place. Uh, can we talk about passenger inf uh, infections? You know, we had the case, the recent case with Endeavor on the flight from Atlanta to Albany. Um, how many instances is Delta seeing, of, you know, hearing back from passengers after a flight about coronavirus infections? And can someone put that into perspective for me? Thank you. Hi, Dawn. It's really minimal. Um, you know, the the, uh, the 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 flight uh, last week was a uh, Endeavor flight, as you mentioned, and that was after the fact uh, that those uh, three customers found out. Um, so there's there's no question that in the general population there's there's a, there's a virus, and uh, when we do find out, we go back and contact trace. Uh, with anyone that would have been in the uh, the immediate vicinity of a customer, but I can tell you those those instances are really really small, and certainly no instances that we've been aware of where there's been any transmission on board our planes. And did that answer your question, ma'am? Yes, thank you. We'll go next to Tracy Rosinski of Reuters. Hi, good morning. Um, I wanted to ask about the outlook for the trainer refinery. Um, do you have any plans to divest it or stop operations? Hey, good morning, Tracy. This is uh, this is Paul. 
So, you know, the trader refinery in the quarter, we, we had uh, about a $100 million loss uh, in the quarter, which was almost uh, entirely focused in the month of April. Um, so the, the refinery is continue to, continuing to, to uh, produce economics at, at break-even level uh, on, on the current trends. And as with everything in the business, we're, we're, we're looking at everything, but uh, our plans have not changed uh, with respect to the refinery right now. And our next question comes from Claire Bushy of Financial Times. Hi. I wanted to ask whether the federal government needs to pass a law requiring masks on airplanes, or do your flight crews have enough uh, leverage with passengers since they can be banned from flying with the airline? Uh, hi, Claire. This is that. I don't know that it needs to pass a law, but I certainly – See the opportunity to reinforce uh, the, the work that the airlines are doing to ensure that customers wear their masks both in the airports as well as on board our planes is helpful. Uh, the airlines, are, I think, are doing a very good job of, of uh, reinforcing that as well as, candidly, customers on board planes. Uh, if someone's not wearing a, a mask, they, they quickly get, uh, get pointed out and, and discussion uh, with our flight attendants occur quickly. Uh, so it's it's really important that that we as a as a nation uh, comply with with mask policy. We're an industry that's got a lot of regulation. I don't know that we need another regulation around mask wearing, but it would be it'd be helpful the stronger that our our federal government can reinforce the need to wear a mask, the better. Not just on air travel, but in uh, in life in general. Thank you. We'll go next to Leslie Joseph of CNBC. Hi, good morning. Um, do you have any idea of how many pilots uh, need to be retrained on different aircraft given the retirements and then also potential furloughs and, and just kind of rejiggering of um, what they're going to be flying and what the cost might be of that? Leslie, it's, it's really premature. The pilot uh, retirement plan still has uh, almost a week yet to run. Um, so we'll, we'll be in a better position to assess that over the next month. As, and we're continuing to work with uh, Alpha to uh, identify ways to uh, to mitigate the need to uh, displace uh, pilots and, and furlough. Thank you. Cecilia, we have time for one final question, please. The final question comes from David Slotnick of Business Insider. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm wondering about blocking the middle seat. Um, have you gotten a sense from passengers or from surveys or anything that people are willing to pay a higher fare to fly a less full airplane? We have received a lot of customer feedback that, in fact, I would say when we surveyed customers today about the reasons you're, you're purchasing a ticket on Delta, uh, the, the space on board the plane, the block middle seats, has gone to the number one reason why, why customers are, are choosing Delta. Uh, they really they, they see it consistent with our brand. Uh, everyone appreciates it's not going to last forever, but in in the face of a health crisis, uh, that space on board really matters, and, and customers are telling that. And we're seeing it in our net promoter scores, which have, have gone up considerably on a year-over-year -year basis, up 20 points in the month of June over last June, which last June was already a good number. And, um, you know, we, we hear it from our corporates. We hear it anecdotally from, from many, uh, you know, many of our travelers. And are you, you know, looking at charging more of a premium or raising your fares um, or anything, or is this more like a, a brand and marketing investment for later once things stabilize? Uh, it's, 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 it's not a brand or marketing investment, and, no, we're not raising our fares to block the middle seat. This is this – is, to us, a really important safety feature, and it's a health health crisis that we're in in, in our country. Uh, by being the most disciplined uh, in, in, put, in terms of the amount of supply and capacity that we're offering, uh, that's benefiting our, our pricing and yield, of course, and uh, that's helping us have a better price on board the overall cabin. So, you know, indirectly, that that is coming through in price. But this is not that's not the objective. The objective here is to make certain that we're restoring consumer confidence in air travel and being true to our, our brand promises. Thank you. 
That will complete the June quarter earnings call. Thank you to everyone for your time and your questions today. Have a, have a great day. Again, that concludes today's conference. Thank you for your participation today.